morning, people. This will be a quick build. This will be part one. So you're tuning in to the uh, Cuban Harrison Chronicles. And this will be part one. I wanted to discuss the Liberty Congress and uh, what it means or what it meant for black people. In the building, peace be in the building. It's good late show, Vasa. So strap up. Go this. So, I want to show something quick on um, a little backdrop of Hubert Harrison. So we're going to deal with this book. And then we're going to go to something else. So this is a second book by Jeffrey B. Perry, Hubert Averson, The Struggle for Equality, 1918 and 1927. So what I want to point out here is just a beat, a brief backdrop of our brother. So I'm going to switch this this way. So this is just a note, all right? It says Hubert Averson used the word Negro with a capital N, as opposed to such words as colored and Negro. And he struggled to have others do the same. The usage is evident in his work in the new Negro movement and the organization that he founded, the Liberty League of the Negro Americans and in his daily activities. It is also evident and the publications that he edited, including The Voice, a newspaper for the New Negro, and the New Negro Monthly, The Negro World, the embryo of The Voice of the Negro, and The Voice of the Negro, results of the capitalization struggles that he had and others waged include the change to the capital N by the International Socialist Review in 1912 by the New York Times in 1930 and after his death. All right, just wanted to talk about that one point, but we, we got to get to something here. Get to something really quick here. Hold on, give me a second. Mm-mm. Oh. I made a mistake and passed it. So there's a lot of primary work in here, but I want to point something out here. Mm-mm-mm-mm. Where did it go? Okay. It says, Harrison played unique single roles in the largest class radical movement, socialism, and the largest race radical movement, the new Negro Garvey movement of his era. He was a major influence on the class radical Randolph, which is April of Randolph Sr., the race radical Marcus Garvey, and other militant new Negroes and common people in the period around World War One. W.A. Domingo, a socialist and the first ed- editor of the Negro World, of Garvey's newspaper explained that Garvey, like the rest of us, Randolph, Robert B. Moore, Grace Campbell, Chandler Owen, Cyril Biggs, and other militant new Negroes followed Hubert Harrison. This is your daddy. The historian and Garvey expert Richard A. Hill refers to Harrison as the new Negro ideological mentor considered the most class conscious of the race radicals and the most race conscious of the class radicals in those years. Harrison is a key link in two great trends of the civil rights black liberation struggle, the labor and civil rights trend associated with April of Randolph and Martin Luther King Jr and the race and nationalist trend associated with Garvey and Malcolm X. King marched on Washington with Randolph at his side, and Malcolm's father was a Garveyite preacher 
and his mother a reporter for Garvey's Negro World, the newspaper for which Harrison had been the principal editor. Harrison's lectures and writings were prolific and wide ranging. He was a pioneering and unraveled soapbox orator and brilliant editor, and he authored the first regular book review section known to Negro dumb. So I just wanted to lay that down. But you want to get to this, uh, the Liberty Congress and what it meant. So the Negro Liberty Congress is a gathering of what you would call the new Negro movement. What's the new Negro movement? It's the new manhood movement in which the people wanted to demand their rights. And they did not want it to play the role of the accommodationists. But we're going to find out what these terms mean as we go along. So it says here, the 1918 Liberty Congress included 115 male and female delegates from 35 states and the District of Columbia. And it stands as an important, though much ignored component of the long civil rights movement. It demanded an end to lynching segregation, disenfranchisement, and call for basic civil rights, included the enforcement of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. It also petitioned the U.S. Congress for federal anti-lynching legislation, which was a demand that the NAACP, headed by his white chairman of the board, Joel E. Springgram, refused to make at the time. During World War I, Spring Grant was a pro-war major in military intelligence and monitored Negroes for the War Department. He supported the creation of the segregated officer training camps, which Harrison and much of the Black press had opposed. Lead efforts to undermine the Black-led Liberty Congress and beginning in 1914 funded the NAACP's eponymous Spring Grant Medal which from 1915 was awarded for the highest or noblest achievements by a living African-American Negro during the preceding year or years. Around the time of the Liberty Congress, Harrison became one of the first Black activists to come under surveillance by the Bureau of Investigation, which had been, been founded in 1908 and in 1935 would be renamed the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The bureau agent who initially investigated him was J.G.C. Cochran in Washington, D.C. Cochran used the services of the special officer C.E. Addison, a colored plainclothes man, and Dr. Arthur Ulysses Craig. This guy is very important because he is one of the first African-American engineers and his high class colored informant, who was a high school teacher, Bureau surveillance of Harrison would continue after he left Washington, and Cochran would also seek to use John E. Bowles and inform it at an American university. Yeah, it's get interesting. It gets it gets really interesting. So I just wanted to lay that down real quick so you can see uh this is some real serious events. Now when we talk about these accommodationists, these are the people who work with the government and the government doesn't have no problem with their ideas and their direction for the Negro. So here you see probably for the first time, the first person or black man put under investigation by this bureau investigation was this man. But what is the Liberty Congress about? We're gonna go into another book. We're going to go into another book. What is this Liberty Congress about? And, and what is the backdrop to this? Let's go to what, what page is this? Let's go to this. Let's blow this up. So William Monroe Trotter is a very important person in the uh, fight for freedom. And he's uh, older than the rest of the individuals. And he has two specific organizations that also dealt with agitating for the rights of the people. In any event, 
You want to read this. It says, in the early part of 1918, while his organizer efforts were slowed and his newspaper suspended, Harrison was particularly concerned about the war and heightened racism and repression at home. So I want to be just dealing with the World War I period. Mr. Wilson, the president, he called this the war of democracy. And in this war of democracy, they had to make sure that everything was going in order, meaning that there were no Americans who were going against said war or anything going on. But at this time, in 1918, Black people are getting lynched all across the country. Mobocracies is happening. People are getting killed, beat up, property getting burnt. And then you have this Negro, this new Negro who comes on the scene and says, no, 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 we're not fighting for your war of so-called democracy if we don't have democracy. We have demands. But let's look up here. Let me go right here. Let's go here. Da, 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 da. Mm, mm, mm. Let's go right here. Dang. This is talking about his work as he started to uh, write more for Pacific Papers, what happened to him when he wrote about Booker T. Washington. But I just want to get to this, do this really quick here. Now, while his interest in Africa and African can peoples continue to grow, Harrison's major activity in the summer of 1918 concerned the June National Liberty Congress, which had been planned for over a year and had grown, in particular out of his work with William Monroe Charter in Massachusetts. The Congress was to be the major wartime national meeting of militant Black leaders in a wide sense. However, it was, as Harrison explained, the result of the words which the Negro American hears and the things which he sees and the disparity and the difference between both Harrison had previously been elected chairman of the board of manager and chosen as a grand national organization of the Congress. The official April 19 call for the Congress specified that it would be held from June 21st through June 29th at the John Wesley AME Zion Church in Washington. All colored churches, businesses, civic, literary, fraternal organizations, and societies were requested to send delegates. And the Congress aimed to press the just claim of the colored American citizens to take share in the world democracy for which they are subject to fight and to take positive measures to secure from the government guarantee of the abolition of disenfranchisement and all caste discrimination, civil and political. The Liberty Congress was to be an all black affair and it would lay before the US Congress methods by which President Wilson and the government may best carry out his great war slogan, to make the world safe for democracy, to make the world a fit place to live. It also hoped, let's go to this, to make democracy safe for the world. A formidable national committee was listed, which included the Reverend Adam Clayton Powell, Sr. of New York, President Alan W. Wheatley of Massachusetts, National Organizers, Organizer Marion F. Sides of Rhode Island, Recording Secretary Hugh of the People's Baptist Church and the Boston Treasurer, Harrison Chairman of the Board, Miss Sarah J. Allen of Massachusetts. All right. As word of the Liberty Congress spread in April, May, and June, major steps were taken by the military intelligence branch of the Army to block and undermine it and counteract the erosion of Black loyalty and to woo more conservative editors. I want this to be very clear. When you see what these Black people are doing and the government wants to get involved and they're about to do what you're about to see, you are now rocking with the best. You are on the right side of history. 
Anytime they sit there and promote you and like you and be amongst you and they say it's okay, then you know it's a problem. Aren't we supposed to learn from history? Let's keep reading. Now, the principal architect of the counter effort was Joe E. Springham, as you heard earlier, the independent wealthy chairman of the board of directors of the NAACP, who was particularly close friend and former financial supporter of W.E.B. Du Bois. Du Bois would later write, I do not think that any other white man ever touched me emotionally so closely as Joe Springham. Look at him. Politically, Springham was strongly behind the U.S. war if effort, and he had been placed with the help of Emmett Scott, the military intelligence, on May 27, 1918. His work was in MI4, or Negative Intelligence. The counterintelligence and anti-radical branch of military intelligence specializing in surveillance and the stopping of enemy propaganda in the United States. Basically, according to historian Roar Tablet, that meant spying on American radicals. In particular, Springham was to carry out intelligent activities on left-wing radical groups and African-American subversive tendencies. Springham was, according to Mark Ellis, a national prominent civil rights activist and the most reactionary agency of an anti-radical administration. And though he recognized that African-Americans' grievances were real, he had misgivings about them being aired during the war. And he believed an important objective of the MIB work on race should be that of molding black opinion. Springham sought to involve W.E. Du Bois in his plans. Shortly after he joined the army, he learned from the assistant U.S. attorney in New York that the NAACP's newspaper, The Crisis, was being monitored for possible violations of the 1917 Espionage Act to counter the MIB's anti-NAACP reports and to protect himself, Springham, over the signature of the MIB director, Colonial Marlborough Churchill, warned NAACP legal advisor Charles A. Studden, the lawyer partner of Springham's brother, Arthur, who was the chairman of the NAACP's legal committee, that the government would not tolerate utterances likely to foment disaffection and destroy the morale of our people for the winning of the war. Stunner was advised to make a special effort to eliminate the matter from the newspaper. So, you know that was done. So now, something happens here. Joe Springham and Du Bois meet in D.C. on June 4th and discuss the possibility of creating a new agency to enlighten the government on racial manners and to promote black loyalty. So basically, Du Bois is, he wants to be the, uh, the eye of Haru on the black people. He wants to be, he wants to be the man. So Springham was maneuvering with Du Bois, Captain Fred W. Moore, a Boston head based intelligence officer, and was working on William Monroe Trotter. On June 5th, Monroe wrote to counsel Colonel Churchill that he had, as requested by his superiors, interviewed Trotter regarding the Liberty Congress. Moore claimed to have explained the dangerous possibilities in all possible lights and to have urged him to secure a postponement of the convention. Trotter did not back down, however, and would not postpone the Liberty Congress. So they're getting mad because they don't want these Negroes to rile up the other black people about them being disenfranchised, lynching, and it's a war going on. And, you know, you should be good Negroes and you will get your civil rights, but make sure you put this some um, uniform on and fight for us. Didn't we hear this before? You heard this before in the Revolutionary War. You heard this before in the War of 1812 and all the wars that came by. Yes. Let's keep reading. Hold on. Oops, I think I skipped something. Mm -hmm. Okay, it says, next, Springham suggesting a special wartime anti-lynching bill was submitted to the Republican Congressman Leonidas C. Dyer 
of Missouri, right? So he wants to put this forward because one of the uh, big things of the Liberty Congress is this lynching. But let's see what happens here. Since anti-lynching legislation was a centerpiece of the agenda of Havison, Charter, and the Liberty Congress, Spring Grand's effort had the appearance of attempting to steal a march on them. In fact, however, Springham was advocating anti-legislation only as a wartime measure pursuant to Article 1 of the Constitution granting Congress the right to declare war to raise us and support armies and make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying out its execution into the foreign powers, not as consistent with the 14th Amendment as Harrison was supposing or proposing. The Springham proposal would be applicable only in wartime and would have been irrelevant after November 1918. So basically, it's sort of like the same thing that happened, you know, during the Civil War when they told the people that they were free. And then you had the great massacre, you know, that took place. And then, you know, the so-called 40 acres that you were supposed to get. And then, you know, the mule was added on. And then you have, you know, Special Order 15 put out. And then he really tells you in his in his writings that um he never intended for this to be uh for the people for these specific people. This was only a, a temporary solution to the, you know, to the ending of the war. That's right. This same thing carries out there in the time. Well, we just going to keep reading. We're going to find out about these goddamn accommodations. We're going to keep reading about this. We're going to see. So anyway, even so the bill was marked for advance over previous NAACP um, positions, though it was part of Springham's overhaul effort to undermine the more militant Liberty Congress. At the same time, it showed that the pending Congress and the hiding level of racial protest were shaping national events. While the Liberty Congress planned to petition Congress to make lynching a federal crime, neither the federal government, the NAACP, nor Springham was prepared to go that far. Hmm. <laughs> yes. In February 1918, the Justice Department had advised President Wilson that there was no constitutional basis for federal anti-lynching laws and that lynching incidents were not connected with the war in any such way to justify the action of the federal government under the war power. From 1918 to 1922, the NAACP, despite educational and agitational work against lynching, stopped short of calling for federal anti-lynching legislation. One major reason was its long-standing effort to gain Southern support. Yeah, very interesting. So overall, Springham's ideas and methods in the area of Negro subversion were, according to Ellis, hastily improvised, unfocused, and overambitious. Oof. The reason is clear because Springham was hastily trying to undermine Charter's Guardian. So the Guardian is the newspaper he wrote. And if you don't know who William Monroe Charter is, he's one of the founders of the Niagara Movement. And, you know, we'll get to that. The Appendant Liberty Consciousness represented autonomous militant race consciousness, Black protest, and was scheduled formally to begin. So what did they do? They said, we got to fire back. So they said, you know what? We're going to get L, all of our Negro coon newspapers. We're going to get all of the black newspapers. And they're going to have to push this message. And we're going to convince them to push this message that you will wait for your civil rights. There's no need to agitate at this time. Wait till after the war and everything's going to be okay. We need all the Negroes to say this, and we will back you. Let's see what happens. 
Not only was Springham trying desperately to block the Liberty Congress and promote the editor's conference, he was on a larger scale attempting, as Harrison later charged, to plot the course of the struggle for Black Americans. On June 13th, Springham wrote to Monroe that he was arranging a confidential conference of the colored race to discuss the present status of the American Negroes. He explained that at the conference, a general policy and program for future work will be formed. And he told Moore that it was highly undesirable before the policies to be adopted by the conference are put in operation that any convention airing the grievances of the colored people should be held at Washington or elsewhere. He added Mr. Trotter should be informed that in the opinion of the military authorities, his convention or conference should be postponed. So for four or five months. So they still trying to stop it. So here's your man. This is your man, Joel L.S. Bingon. There you go. NAAC military officer on deck. <laughs> it's your man to know. It's your man to know. So more so, more also informed charter but the government authorities had underestimated the breadth and depth of Black dissatisfaction and the commitment to the militant leaders. On June 15th, Robert R. Morton, who had succeeded Booker T. Washington as president of the Tuskegee Institute and was a very moderate leader, wrote a revealing letter to President Wilson Moulton, complained there is more genuine re more genuine restlessness and perhaps dis oops, disaffection on the part of the colored people than I have ever before known. <laughs> yeah. In any event, they got this editor's conference on June 19th and 21st, went pretty much according to plan. Emmett Scott followed Springham's suggestion and persuaded George Creel to hold the conference in Washington. Scott's aim was the Negro public opinion should be led along helpful lines rather than along lines that make for discontent and unrest. The conference attracted 47 more moderate black leaders, including 31 from the press. There were no women in attendance. Labor was not represented and the South was underrepresented. Among those in attendance were editors from the leading Black newspapers, including John A. Murphy, Baltimore Afro-American, George W. Harris, New York News, Edward A. Warren, New York Amsterdam News, Robert L. Ben, the Pittsburgh Carrier, Fred R. Moore, the New York Age, <clears throat> Tuskegee Machine, <clears throat> yeah, uh, Benjamin Davis, Atlanta Independent and Robert S. Abbott, Chicago Defender, The Boys to Crisis, all these people. Um, and Robert R. Morton, president of the Tuskegee Institute, prominent speakers included the Secretary of War, blah, 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 blah. So these are all of the people that they got down with the plan. The plan. What's the plan? We need to make this conference to stop these Black Negroes who are trying to enlighten the people and tell them what to do for the protection of all Negroes in America. These militant Negroes must be stopped at all costs, calling all coon niggas to the front. Accommodations. Let's keep moving. Two documents emerged from the conference. One was a bill of particulars in which it suggested that an action might be taken, which was to be submitted privately to bureau heads in Washington. The second was an address to the Committee on Public Information written by W.E. Du Bois and signed by all 47 confers, which was forwarded by Crail. An official bulletin of the conferences that extended, extracted from the adopted resolution was basically Du Bois's draft. It was sanitized. Look at the word they use, sanitized, by Scott and Springham, was issued on the July 29th. Among the passages omitted from the June 21st address when it was reprinted from the August crisis were the most important, those dealing specifically with the justifiable grievances of Black Americans, which said, 
first and foremost among these grievances is lynching. Federal intervention to suppress lynching is imperative. Congress should pass legislation that would enable the federal government to go to the limit of the Constitution under war powers to stamp out the custom and action should be taken against discrimination in services and travel. So that was sanitized. The editor's conference have been called with government support and much fanfare, and it purposely aimed to undermine the Liberty Congress. Talbot concluded that the MIB's Colonel Churchill saw that the editor's conference as a countermeasure. So these people were paid. They got, they didn't have to pay to go there. The niggas got food, all that shit. All right. All right. Chief among those not heeding such counsel was Harrison, who, while extremely critical of Scott and Spring, I placed principal blame on Du Bois for his betrayal. Damn. Harrison would explain in the article the descent of Dr. Du Bois that his suspicions have first been aroused by the government investigation of the crisis, after which the magazine stopped publication of material critical of the government. The government's approach, both Harrison, was tantamount to the declaration that protests against lynching, segregation, and disenfranchisement were outlawed by the government. Hmm. We're almost there. We about to wrap it up. So, what did the Liberty Congress do? What happened? Let's, I'm not going to read all of the people, but this elaborates more on the beginning of the opening. It said the Liberty Congress began with an organizational planning from June 21st to the 23rd. And that was followed by the actual Congress, a grueling six days and five nights from June 24th to the 29th. And three sessions held daily from Monday to Friday and to Saturday. The morning and afternoon sessions were for delegates only. And the evening sessions were open to the public. The Congress was attended by 115 delegates, including five women from 33 states and the District of Columbia. They came from 10 southern states, unlike, you know, the, you know, the handpicked one over there with the other guys. They ain't happy people from the south. But anyway, they came from 10 southern states as far away as Oklahoma. And then these are all of the people. If you want to get a chance, you could screenshot this and uh, you'll see it. Here's Mr. William Monroe Trotter, black man on deck. He also went and talked to Wilson. He went in the office and screamed on him. And Wilson could believe that a Negro came to him and uh, talked to him in this manner. Stand up, Monroe William Trotter. In any event, Harrison subbed up the general theme of the Liberty Congress in one of his speeches as protest, protest. During the public sessions of the Congress, the church was filled every night. And what he told the audience was a vision of the future of race responding to a great occasion. Um, is this something I wanted to, oh no, okay. Harrison played the central role during the entire Congress. He arrived in Washington around 6 p.m. on June 22nd. And though he was nominally there as an organizer of the hotel and restaurant workers, his trip was actually paid for by Irina Morsman Blackson. He immediately threw himself into the maelstrom of informal activities and then on June 24th reported to the John Wesley AME Zion Church, the largest black church in the city where the sessions were held. Monday, the first day consisted largely of details, formation of committees. The principal committees were resolutions, lynching, segregation, and those to confer with the Speaker of the House of Representatives, which included Trotter, Harrison, and Isaac B. Allen, and the President of the Senate. Yeah, so they going, they, they, they not playing. So hold on, you gotta zoom in on this picture here. So these are the black men who they was trying to stop, the black men and the black woman, who the coons, the accommodationists wanted to stop because these, Right, they're, they're just too radical. They're, they're, I, we don't know what's wrong with them. Anyway, 
On Tuesday, upon introductions from the Liberty Congress, the committee, Car um, Harrison, Trotter, and uh, Stanford of Washington, C went to meet with leaders of the U.S. Congress. According to Harrison, they waited upon the president of the Senate, whom we didn't see, and upon the Speaker of the House of Representatives, James P. Clark, who accorded us a kindly and gentle reception. So they get to go in there. They're basically putting their grievance on the floor. Okay. As the clock approached midnight, Harrison introduced by the chairman, Spencer, and begged the audience to hear the next night. They responded, no way. And there were cries from all over the church for Harrison, Harrison. When Spencer asked those who insisted on hearing Harrison that night to stand, about four-fifths of the audience did so. Harrison then spoke for about 40 minutes on Negro democracy, explaining that as a priest of democracy, he would preach a sermon from a single text. He began by emphasizing, we shall fight for the things we hold nearest to our heart, for democracy, for the right of all those who submit to authority having a voice in their own government. He continued on explain, explaining that the Congress of Liberty Loving Negroes had to express approval of the president of the United States who had uttered these words. Okay, let's go here. Hold on, y'all. Give me one second. All right, we about to get back in it. Hold on, I had to do that really quick. My bad, I'm almost done. I gotta wrap this up quick anyway. Cause I got a, I got a boogie woogie. Okay, Harrison next explained that the white man who run the country have finally learned that the lackeys and stool pigeons could no longer be trusted as exponents of Negro sentiment. He quoted the words of Malton, who told Secretary of War Baker, I want to say to the white people that I have done my best and they have not got to do something. If they don't, I hope they wouldn't hold me responsible for the result. To Harrison, this was a typical confession of the old leaders, the confessions that they were truly powerless to guide the masses any longer by lies, trickery, and subversion. He then challenged the United States to win the war by giving his best effort, which required the change of 12 million Negroes from the status of nigger until that of man. On completing his speech, Harrison received a big ovation. All right. Oh, we almost there. I'm about to bring it home. We about to bring it home. On Friday, another large oops. On Friday, another large Liberty Congress audience had heard Trotter read the petition to the House of Representatives, which had been submitted to the representatives Frederick Huntington Gillick, who entered it into the congressional record on June 28th. The, the, the petition demanded that lynching be made a federal crime and was approved unanimously and signed by 81 delegates from 21 states, including 10 southern states and the District of Columbia. It was circulated on behalf of 12 million colored Americans desiring liberty and rights of democracy. It protested against racial proscriptions in three-fourths of the states and the national capital and public carriers and one-third of the states and interstate travel. So basically, they was going in. And what happens here is the Liberty Congress gained national attention by petitioning Congress for federal legislation against lynching. Though its militant wartime demands vote Harrison, it also called the attention of the people of the United States to the danger into which democracy is put by disenfranchisement, discrimination, and lynching. 
that this was a valid premise, he argued, was even demonstrated by the editor's conference, which despite efforts to lead it along with Scott termed helpful non, spoke of the justifiable grievances of the colored people that were producing not disloyalty, but an amount of unrest and bitterness, which even the best efforts of the leaders may not be able always to guide. After the close of the Liberty Congress, Harris began very publicly to address the subject of black leadership. He was particularly troubled by the role that Du Bois had played. His concern was practically aroused when Du Bois wrote what was probably the most controversial editorial of his life, Close Ranks. In the July 1918 issue, The Crisis, only two paragraphs long, its last two sentences were aimed at African-Americans and read, let us, while this war lasts, forget our special grievances and close ranks shoulder to shoulder with our own white fellow citizens and the live nations that are fighting for democracy. We make no ordinary sacrifice, but we make it gladly and willingly with our eyes lifted to the hills. Let me read this again. Let us, while this war lasts, forget our special grievances and close ranks shoulder to shoulder with our white fellow citizens. What? So when we say accommodationist, this is the this is what we're talking about. This is what we're talking about. Yo, while this is going on. We we'll leave our we, we, you can rape us, kill us, drag us, do whatever you want, but um let's get behind the war. Clearly, accommodationist in spirit, the editorial was written at Joel Springherm's urging as Du Bois saw a commission as a captain in military intelligence. The agency of the US general staff that monitored and intimidated both blacks and radicals. The editorial was a key part of the government effort to undermine the militant and autonomous Liberty Congress. It was also a significant departure from the position taken by the MWACP as recently as its May 1917 National Conference, at which it proclaimed absolutely loyalty in arms and civil duties. Need not for the moment lead us to abate our just complaints. Seems how that changed. In any event, it says Harrison was correct in linking the editorial to Du Bois' quest for the captaincy because the publication of the editorial while Du Bois was in Washington for the editor's conference, Colonel Marlboro Churchill, director of military intelligence, arranged for him to take a physical examination at the Army Medical School. Though Du Bois failed the physical, the fact did not appear to be a major obstacle, and Joe Springham sent details of the voice's career to military intelligence. And long, anyway, they basically, they shut him down. You did all of this shit for nothing. You put this message out there, and your ass couldn't be the military officer that you wanted to be. It's sad. Havison responds to the voice mark him as a spearhead of the opposition of closed ranks and as a spokesperson for the militant new Negro movement. William Monroe tried to soon issue the similar critique and in a short time, so did the Negro world. The series of events surrounding and including the Liberty Congress and the editor's conference led in the eyes of Harrison and both others to the decline of Du Bois as the permanent race leader in the post Booker T. Washington area and Harrison was the leading proponent of this view. Harrison then used these developments to offer suggestive comments on autonomous black leadership. Um, Where we at? I think that's the end of that chapter. I got a boogie. I got to get out of here. But um, I'm going to put this here at the beginning. This is the book here. We're going to be going through uh, part two. We'll be on the Liberty League. And we're going to talk about who he influenced because people want to know, well, what did he do? And uh, he, he has no institutions. No, this is the man. This is the man that the white man was scared of. This is the man 
that you just saw, just doing this one thing, one thing that they got all of these people involved to try to shut this man down. This is the man. This is the man. And we're going to go over this man. We're going to, every week, we're going to be going over something that he did. Next week is going to be the Liberty League. And we're going to keep going. The other book we looked at was this book here. This one is called Hubert Harrison. Uh, this is the second book. We got this one. So we got to talk about him. That picks up off of that book. And then there's one I did not go over, which I should have, but I got to go. I just wanted to. Where did it go? Um, this one. Black radical William Monroe Trotter. Yeah. This one right here is lit. This one is lit. This is lit. This is lit. So this goes over it. Um, let me see if I could. Um, hmm. This is his perspective of it. All right. Um, it says, as a result of Charter's use of the reinvigorated radical black press to galvanize the new Negro support for his proposed Liberty Congress, the League preserved the autonomy of his member organizations without forcing them to become an affiliate or stifling their local agenda. Rather, League rallies um, reassembled the NERL, that's the name of his organization, annual convention. As the result, the radicals mobilized Black community rage and new Negro militancy into a National Liberty League movement. The East St. Louis, Illinois race riot, less than a month after the rally at the Metropolitan Baptist, caught the attention of the Congressman Leonidas Dyer, Missouri Republican, who support the anti-legislation coincided with the decisive shift in Charter's radicalism. So this gets deep. We're going to get into this. We're going to get into this some more. I should have waited till later, but I got to go. But um, yeah. We're gonna get in, we, we're gonna get into this so you can see the cover of this book. Let me scroll up here. This is my man Trotter. But we're gonna get in it. Don't worry. We're gonna talk about that. So we talked about the Liberty Congress and its effect, what it did, and how that kind of like really sparks this new Negro militancy. And then we're gonna look at the programs and the things that come out of that. We're gonna look at some of these leaders. And we banging on the accommodate. We banging on the accommodations. We banging on them. We banging on them. You saw what you saw what he said. What he said. What he said. Oh, we're gonna put our grievances to the side. All of them dudes got bread to go there. Not these dudes. They had to pay on their own. That's the problem. Yes, sir. Watch out for those guys, man. I'm trying to tell you, watch out for them, man. But uh. Let me look in the chat. We might not even. Have, we will see what's going on here. Let's go here. Let's see what we got here. What's going on in the Chizak? And let's see what's going on. Oh, 36 in the building. What's good? Yeah. Peace to everybody. TK, I'm on their neck. This is just part one. This is a brief one. This is part one. Wait till part two come out. Wait till part two come out. Wait till we hit them with part two. Can we do this on Clubhouse, please? Yeah, yeah, we we, we could do it. But wait till we get part two. Wait, wait till the Liberty League come. And then we're going to work backwards and then go forwards. We're going to talk about the Lyceums. We're going to talk about all that. We're going ham. These accommodation, this is going under the bus. You saw with your own eyes, you know, I had to start out with the with the smoke. We had to get straight down to it. I, I didn't feel like going over the foundation, but we had to go right to what's going on. And that right there seems to be the number one problem with all of our organizations and institutions and things that we built. They get infiltrated, people sell their soul or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, it's bad. But I'm out of here. I got to go. But peace to the fam. Peace to the fam. 
we off.